whatever the issue might might be. Hopefully we don't run into any problems, but all right, we are recording. So getting right into it, this is our Back to Basics Nutrition and Healthy Living 101. So it's January, like I mentioned earlier, we are almost through the first month of the new year, but many of us are just getting started or still trying to um, stay on track with our, what you want to call it, New Year's resolutions or our um, healthy ambitions for for the future. So we're going to cover um, where to begin. Nutrient-dense foods, what are they? What does that mean? What does a healthy grocery shopping list look like? Portion control, so what should healthy and maybe um, the occasional not-so-healthy foods look like and, and be portioned to? Making a SMART goal. And SMART is an acronym, S-M-A-R-T. We'll get into what that means later. And then wrapping up a nice quick takeaway, uh, four simple steps that you can implement today for a healthier you. So nutrient-dense versus calorie-dense foods. I have a handout for this and the portion control that will kind of um, flip back and forth to between that and, and the PowerPoint in a minute here. But nutrient dense foods basically give us the best bang for our buck. And that means that they give us a lot of um, nutrients, vitamins, and minerals, um, a lot of good uh, protein and good fats for the fewest calories. So the opposite of nutrient dense is calorie dense. And calorie dense kind of sounds it's just what it sounds like. So it's high in calories, um, very calorie dense, but not very high in nutrients. So examples would be of a nutrient dense food is one serving of grilled or baked um, skinless chicken is about three ounces, which we'll see in a minute on um, the portion control handout is roughly the size of a deck of cards and that's 160 calories. Now, I am pretty full when I have, um, you know, three ounces of a serving of chicken or um, shredded meat that, that gets me, you know, I'm pretty satisfied for a while after that. But calorie dense, um, same kind of serving uh, and calories would be uh, <laughs> two double stuffed Oreo cookies. So again, that's just one serving of Oreos is two cookies and 140 calories. So pretty close to the 160 calories from the serving of chicken. And I don't know about you, um, but I don't know many people, myself included, who um, can stop at just two Oreos and also they don't really fill us up. So that's why choosing nutrient dense is important. And looking at some more foods, applying those examples to maybe when we're doing a grocery shopping in the store, you may have heard the recommendation to shop the perimeter. That's a good tip. Um, that's a good place to start, but it's not foolproof. So, <laughs> you know, in health coaching, I've, I've brought this up and said, yeah, shop the perimeter. And, and um, sometimes people say, well, you know, Tasha, what also is in the perimeter is you have your ice cream and your frozen foods and, <laughs> um, and your desserts and like, yep, you're right. You know, um, you're, you're, you're not wrong. So, and also there are plenty of healthy foods in the aisles and in the um, middle part of the grocery store. We just have to know where to look. So this grocery shopping list I'm about to pull up should help with that. All right, everyone doing well so far? I can see my screen. No issues. I'm going to pop back here into the chat. Any messages or concerns doesn't look like okay very good so eating the most nutritious foods like we mentioned um, getting the biggest bang for your buck nutritionally and staying low in calories this was attached to today's meeting reminder that I emailed out a little while ago so you should all have this um, if you would like me to send it again or to a different email address maybe a personal email happy to do that so you have this on hand and hopefully can use it as a guide moving forward but we like how this breaks down kind of each food category and even you might be surprised to see um, there's some packaged snacks beverages and frozen canned food categories on here as well but like I mentioned there are plenty of great nutrient dense options in those inner aisles it's not necessarily exclusive to just the perimeter. So some good ones here. I'm not going to read through every every single one, but I'll just kind of pull out a couple high points. 
Um, fruits, we want to go with um, berries, any kind of berry, strawberry, blackberry, blueberry, um, elderberry. They're all really good um, for for nutrients, they're high in antioxidants, um, low in sugar, and therefore lower in calories. And those are a good one too. So berries are probably the best one on this list of fruit if you are someone who's watching your blood sugar. Because like I mentioned, they are one of the lowest fruits in sugar, low in calories, but still give you a lot of great antioxidants and, and nutrients. Getting down to our veggies, the one thing I, I mentioned last week during um, the, the first class session of this virtual workshop was uh, the, the takeaway to summarize um, good nutrient dense vegetables is avoid, not just vegetables, but food in general, <laughs> is to avoid anything, any foods that are white that are not vegetables. So again, not just limited to veggies, but every food category here. Think about the foods that are white. So white rice, bread, crackers, cookies, chips, desserts, cereal, <laughs> all, the, all the good food, right? Pasta. Um, so those tend to be very calorie dense, high calorie and low nutrients, um, deliver a lot of carbs, maybe don't keep us full very long because they don't have a lot of the good lean protein in them. So avoiding those processed white foods and then thinking about vegetables, well, I say the only white foods you should eat should be vegetables. So what is that going to be? That's going to be um, your onions, um, leeks, ginger. It's a nice little aromatic flavor to some dishes. And then we like sweet potatoes on here instead of regular potatoes. Again, you get that color. Think of like color of the rainbow, um, orange represents more nutrients over the traditional white potatoes. I'm going to pause here for any questions, comments. Yeah. Great question. Thank you so much. So um, in our chat, we have, um, I've heard that I can buy veggies and water with sodium and rinse them and it's just like buying no sodium um, added or canned veggies. That's a good trick if you can't find um, canned vegetables without um, sodium or a good trick too is looking for something that's in their own juice versus in, um, let's go back to this list here. So down in the frozen or in canned food section. So looking for something, if you can't find low sodium or in water for vegetables or fruits, um, canned fruit is a big thing too, especially if you have kiddos at home. Um, try to look for something that says in its own juice. Or um, if you can't, and if the only option is either in a high sodium liquid or um, sometimes you'll see the fruit cups that, that say... Um, in like a, a fruit syrup <laughs> so so the fruits might be sitting in in a can or container of syrup um you know it, if you can't find the healthier alternatives of those yeah taking them home putting them in like one of those colanders um and then you know kind of just rinsing them real quick and at least separating them from um, the liquid in that can is the next best thing yep great question great point thank you for sharing and then on that too with beverages and snacks again like i mentioned you know i might be kind of surprised to see these on here as nutrient dense options but again we can find healthier options um, in a lot of places so with beverages this is a, another common question in health coaching i'm looking for things that say 100 percent fruit juice and this is deceiving because food companies purposely <laughs> try to trick us um and they'll say it's you know fruit flavored um or fruit juice but you have you know then you flip it over to the back and look at that label and it says 20% fruit juice um, or, you know, 5% vegetable juice. Um, and that's, again, you know, not really nutrient dense. It's more calorie dense at that point. So looking for things that say 100% um, fruit or vegetable juice is more nutrient dense, low in calories. Be aware of that sugar and sodium content as well. Um, look for those, you know, lower sodium options when, when you can especially if you're watching things like blood sugar or blood pressure. So for snacks then, 
You'll see dried fruit on the list, but notice that there's no um, trail mix. <laughs> so we kind of took out the, the good parts of things like trail mix. Um, you have the nuts, some dried fruits is okay. Um, you know, air popped popcorn, try to avoid the microwave popped popcorn. And then like sunflower seeds, things like that. With nuts and seeds, I always say uh, try to avoid the roasted and salted. So a lot of times, and I know those are the best tasting ones too, <laughs> or the really good ones are like the honey glazed um, nuts. Those are, are super yummy, but again, getting more towards the calorie dense and, and away from the good nutrient dense there. So try to get your nuts and seeds unsalted and unroasted and then just um, plain if you can. It might be kind of a, a big transition to make. So try just choosing, you know, making one um, alteration going from um, maybe your traditional roasted and salted nuts to, you know, just roasted and not salted. And then maybe over time you can transition to completely unroasted, unsalted. So it's a transition. But again, hopefully a good uh, a good guide here. Something to get you started with, and maybe you know take to the grocery store moving forward. Awesome. Any other questions on that before we jump back into the slide deck and move on to portion control? So far, so good. All right. So getting into portion control and, and what that means, something that I like to tell everyone in health coaching is even too much of good stuff is still too much. So there is such a thing um, as, you know, um, having too much of too much water, having um, too much fiber, um, having too much protein, you know, we, we need to moderate everything. But usually we don't run into the issue of someone eating too many vegetables. That's I don't know. I've seen a lot, heard a lot in um, the last 10 years of my career. I'm sure Courtney has too. But I think I have yet to have someone come in and say that they eat too many vegetables. So um, but uh, hey, you know what? We're young. It's early. And that could still happen. Um, usually, though, it's more common that people are eating too much of the unhealthy foods of those calorie dense foods, not on the list that we just went through. So portion control across the board, what should that look like? What does it mean? Um, research backs us up in, in showing this, that people consistently eat more when offered more. So a good example that I like to use to highlight this is think of when, um, you know, we might go out to eat. So Olive Garden, that's my, my classic culprit that I like to bring up when talking about portion control. Um, you know, everyone enjoys a good plate of pasta once in a while, but, you know, if you go out to Olive Garden and, and get one of their dishes, think of how huge those plates and bowls are and they fill all of it and most of it's um, you know high starchy carb remember I said to avoid any food any processed foods that are white you know that are not vegetables so lots of pasta or rice um, gives us a lot of calories and those portion sizes are usually up to four times what they should be so we're eating four times more calories in one sitting let's pull up um, that portion control handout so it's it's going to kind of maybe get the gears turning on what are some common day objects that we can compare to foods. Most people I know, and myself included, you know, we're not walking around with a food scale um, or ways to, to measure our, our portions. So these are just a nice way to kind of eyeball it um, and compare to, again, common everyday objects. We don't have every single food listed on here, but again, a lot of the common ones and common objects. So you may have um, remember me mentioning at the beginning the comparison between the serving of chicken um, and serving of Oreos. One serving of chicken is three ounces. That's roughly the size of a deck of cards. Or I say a little bit smaller than the modern day smartphone. <laughs> I like to also pull out the example of one serving of nuts is one ounce, which is one small handful. And I like to talk about this because um, saying one small handful can be very subjective um, and open to interpretation. And also depending upon the person, um, you know, a small person is going to have a smaller handful than than a bigger person. So 
I say with um, one serving of nuts, have a really tightly cupped um, palm. You know, you can make your handful bigger if you if you kind of leave your your hand and your fingers stretched out more. But if you kind of curl that palm up, um, it restricts the area and hopefully gets you a little bit closer, if not holding you to that one ounce serving. If you'd like to really, um, you know, do your diligence and count, I've seen an actual number like on some uh, bags of almonds we'll say a specific number like 18 almonds or something um, is one serving size that's going to change depending upon the type of nuts as well um, but again most people don't want to be that specific if you do more power to you you have that option um, the numbers are usually there on the back with uh, the nutrition facts label but one small handful is definitely better um, than not limiting yourself or not being mindful at all and then going down, um, cheese, you know, what kind of Wisconsinite would I be if I didn't highlight cheese in our in our portion control discussion? So um, one serving size of cheese is about an ounce and a half. Again, what does that look like? We don't have a food scale on us 24-7, so that's going to be about four dice, which is really depressing. <laughs> Maybe especially after you, if you're a Packer fan or just football fan in general, watching um, yesterday's games, then... You may have had more than one and a half ounces of cheese. Just to be mindful, though, if you have, let's say, eight dices, dice size worth um, pieces of cheese, you know, then that's three ounces. That's two servings. Um, so you've already doubled, you know, the, the portion size that you should be having for that food. Something helpful to keep in mind, you know, to, to cut back on the rest of your eating throughout the day and just be mindful of how much we really are consuming. It's so easy to just take two big handfuls or, you know, a few slabs of cut up cheese and not really know if we're overeating or undereating, but this hopefully helps. <laughs> yep, portioning cheese is pretty darn hard. I, like I said, especially after um, or during yesterday, I I give people a lot of credit if you can. Um, a nice trick though too, and actually I I do this is I like really flavorful sharp cheese, um, and it's something we recommend in health coaching. So if you like the extra sharp or sharp cheddar, or if you like the pepper jack, um, things with a lot of flavor tend to to kind of go for further um, than those real mild cheeses. So think of things like mozzarella um, or very mild cheddar. It has a really, kind of, I don't want to say plain, I mean it still has flavor, um, but you can eat a lot more of it and it's not very overwhelming versus those really intensely flavored cheeses. Um, things like Gouda um, are really flavorful too. So those actually are a bit easier to try to stick to um, the one and a half ounce servings. Or like I said, you know, even if you do two servings, that's three ounces. That's still less than if, you know, you're not being mindful and thinking about it at all. Going down to beverages, this is classic liquid calories for portion, portion control trouble, we say. So looking at, again, the, the juice, if you can get 100% juice, um, if it's not 100% juice, that means that there's a lot more sugar than actual fruit content in there. Same thing um, with like those vegetables like Bolt House Farms um, or like the, the naked juice drinks. I need to say 100% juice from uh, whether it's fruit or vegetables doesn't matter. Um, it's not, if it's not 100%, then, then there's um, more sugar and more calories in there than what you would like. Okay, so flipping back to our PowerPoint. And again, um, these two handouts, the portion control and the nutrient-dense shopping list, um, were in the email send out this morning. If anyone would like those again or sent to a different email address, more than happy to do that. So just let us know. Okay, so for the last 10 minutes or so here, we're going to kind of apply what we talked about with nutrition um, into SMART goal setting. Like I mentioned, we're going to go through the SMART acronym and what does that mean. And I'm going to use the example of exercise since we kind of just hit nutrition pretty hard. So I'm going to use my exercise goal. I'm going to use an example. Um, setting a SMART goal brings you structure and a, a clear um 
process and path to your objective. And this is why most New Year's resolutions fail is because they are not specific enough or obtainable or realistic. So we're going to look at what how you can make your resolutions um, and future goals better and, and more likely to be successful. So what we encounter often is someone will come in and say, hey, I want to be more active. That's my goal. Okay, that's very general. Um, what exactly does that mean? So my example for being specific is I would like to exercise for 30 minutes at least three times a week and it'll be at home on my treadmill. And that answers all of these points here. We say, ask yourself or consider the five W's. And really, you know, you don't necessarily have to write them down. Some people like to do that, um, but at least give them some thought and make sure that you can answer each of these five W questions before proceeding with your goal to make sure that you have all your bases covered. So again, exercising for at least 30 minutes, three times a week at home on my treadmill, just me, um, that answers each point. And that's a lot more specific and a lot clearer than just saying I want to be more active. We can actually quantify that, which gets into the next um, part, which is measurable. So M is measurable. And this not only allows you to identify what exactly um, you need to do to reach your goal and track your progress, but it really helps to give you some of that gratification too um, and, and sense of achievement when you are putting in that work every day and every week and wanting to see, you know, some payoff for it. Things like, you know, very basic, a, a simple example is measuring your weight or waist circumference. And then attainable, so the A and the R are very similar. So attainable is making sure that the goals you set are able to be achieved based off of what you have available to you. And they should be challenging, right? Like every everything worth having in life usually gets takes a little bit of work, um, especially our you know improving and, and optimizing our health usually isn't isn't easy, um, but it's worth it. However, it should be attainable, not completely out of reach. So realistic is not only is it worthwhile and is it relevant to me, um, but is it, you know, is it going to be something that keeps me motivated for the long run? Or is it something that just sounded good in the moment, you know, on New Year's Day to lose 30 pounds this year? Is that still something that I'm going to be very motivated and very passionate about pursuing in a month or six months? So using my exercise example here, kind of continuing through this uh, smart goal scenario, exercising three times a week for 30 minutes. Um, for me, that is realistic. I know for sure I can hit that three times per week. Um, there are seven days in a week, so I'm giving myself the benefit of the doubt by the, the minority um, of the number of days dedicated to exercise. If I happen to get a fourth exercise session in during the week or a fifth, that's great. That's even better. Um, we as health coaches encourage our um, clients to set more conservative goals because we see this all too often. People come in and they're very excited, which is great. Um, they say, I'm going to be more active. and I'm going to work out. You know, we say, okay, what does that look like? Be more specific, right? Well, okay, I'm going to work out every day. Okay, <laughs> maybe, you know, not, not to um, dampen the mood, but maybe instead of going from not working out at all to exercising every day, what is something that's a bit more realistic and attainable? Um, say up for success instead of failure type thing. So we want to go in the middle, something that we know we can achieve. And then lastly, the T is time-based or time-bound um, or time frame. Just something with time that, again, we can create a timeline and stick to it. So short-term goal, the example, again, of exercise, maybe the purpose is to be able to um, keep up with your kids and you know that they're going to be really active in summer. So maybe your your goal um, is going to be uh, spring or, or, or summer, you know, April, May or June sometime. We would set a date for that. Maybe you're training for a 5K or a 10K. So what's the date of that event? Um, is it short term or long term? And that can be broken down into a middle term too. So it could be, you know, usually three months is short term. Um, 
up to six months is, is midterm, and then anything more than six or 12 months is considered long-term. So to keep that in mind too, when setting your SMART goal. I know we talk about months and three months being short-term and, and usually we want results and to achieve our goal before then. But remember, it's a process, it's a journey. Achieving your goals and, and staying accountable um, is all part of it. We always say verbalize your goals and your ambitions to make it real. Get your social support system and network of people around you aware of what you're working towards so you have that many more people helping to keep you on track. And then lastly, as promised, four simple steps to a healthier you. Things that you can take and implement right away today, tomorrow, and then grow on the next day and the next day. So hydration, we never want to undersell the importance of water. Um, the, the recommendation, the old recommendation of drinking 64 ounces or eight eight ounce glasses of water a day is very general that's not specific enough so what is a glass um what does eight ounces look like well and and also 64 ounces for everybody isn't really individualized enough um, for each person we're all very different shapes and sizes and so we all need different amounts of hydration and water intake um so we say it should be about half your body weight in ounces um so my example is half of let's say you know, if I weigh 200 pounds, half of that is 100. So aiming towards 100 ounces of water a day. And again, you know, just start by drinking what you can. Or if you already drink, let's say 40 ounces of water a day, add another, another bottle of water to that. And with that, I say get a consistent size is the same size bottle every day. So I have a um, 40 ounce bottle like a thermos. And my goal is to fill that and drink that two and a half times a day to get my 100 ounces of water. And if you hate water and it's boring and not exciting, you're not alone. Um, some really good tips to help you get that water in uh, without calories is a flavored tea, like a nice tea bag. Um, any other comments here? Nope, I thought I saw the thing flashing. Okay, that's right. If anyone has any comments or questions, go ahead and, and um, throw them in the chat. Okay, so I like to get tea bag. Actually, I have a pomegranate acai berry tea bags at home. I also have what is it called? It's Good Earth is the brand, and it's just like. Um, you can get caffeinated or decaffeinated. It's just a bag of tea with different herbs and spices and flavors in it. And I just, you know, throw that bag in my big 40 ounce um, water bottle and, and it will steep even if it's in cold water. It just takes a little bit longer, but you definitely still get that flavor in there throughout the day. Um, a little bit more exciting and something different than just plain water. So lots of, lots of tips and tricks and when there's a will, there's a way. So moving I say if you're sitting for an hour, make it a point to get up and move for five. So sit for 60, move for five. Take a five-minute standing, stretching, moving, walking, water, drinking break um, every hour. There's a lot of research saying how detrimental sitting is to our health for long periods of time. I am, just because I'm a health coach does not mean I'm perfect. I definitely am not. So I rely on um, technology and sometimes, you know, good old pen and paper planner to remind me what I needed to do and what I, I set out to do. I have, uh, Courtney can attest to this, um, a standing and moving break scheduled in my phone for the morning and afternoon. A little alarm that goes off helps me stay on track recommend people to use that too and um it's a nice nice trick so nutrition i think we covered a lot with nutrition with the portion control and nutrient dense food shopping list again um try swapping in the higher nutrients brown rice or wheat pasta instead of the white starchy pasta and rice and here we have those nutrient dense. This is, these are like my personal favorite <laughs> snacks. I have them today. I have some turkey jerky. I had low fat string cheese. I have a handful of nuts instead of chips or crackers. Would I like to have a donut instead? Sure, I will. <laughs> I will always love a donut, um, but I don't buy them. And I don't bring them. I bring healthier nutrient dense things instead. 
and it's okay. I survive. And they're still pretty good. Sleeping, last but not least, send you off with some thoughts about your your recharging time tonight, this evening when you get home or when you're done with work, if you're already working from home and you're wrapping up things to help you relax and unwind, get ready for sleep. So um, this isn't on here, but it, it should be. And I something I always say, Courtney and I always tell um, during, people during coaching anyway is be done eating at least two hours before you go to bed. So if your bedtime is say 10 o'clock, you should be done eating by 8 p.m. at the very latest. This helps our body to um, get a better handle on digesting that food so that it's not still working its way through our digestive system and keeping us awake and our organs kind of working um, more than they need to be while we're trying to sleep. And then with that, of course, if you have a, a set bedtime that you're trying to be done eating a couple hours beforehand, um, make sure that it's consistent. So, of course, during the week it might be different than the weekend, but try to set a consistent bedtime and stick to it. I just saw this blinking again, so I didn't know if someone said anything else. Doesn't look like it. Okay. And then last but not least, um, no screen time for at least a half hour. That means computer screen, phone screen, and TV screen included. We've talked about this more on our podcast. And, yep, Courtney and I have a podcast, so we've done a sleep segment. Can include information about that on the recording email that I send out later today. As for our virtual workshop on Back to Basics, Getting Started, beginning this year off on a, a healthy and positive, optimistic note. <laughs> I would say it can't be any worse than, than 2020, right? But then as soon as I say that, it gets worse. So we're going to pretend I did not say that. I'll knock on wood. Um, and hopefully this is um, the start of good things to come. So we thank you very much for joining us. I'll stick around here if there are any other questions. Any other comments? Thank you so much for taking your time today. We are here for health coaching support. If you need accountability, if you need something to make you laugh, we've been known to be good for that too. And we hope that you have a great rest of your week. Take care.